<clears throat> but yeah, here in front. <laughs> yeah, I have a question about how do you expect to enforce these goals because Paris Agreement goals are already <coughs> not really enforced. So if you set up higher goals, how do you expect them to be enforced? Uh, uh, well, first of the goals that we demand are not, not higher than the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, second of, uh, I think we keep on doing what we do best at Fridays for Future, and that is putting the pressure on them so that they finally move. Uh, the European Citizen Initiative is not a legally binding instrument. It's a policy setting framework. Uh, but as you have seen with Right to Water and other ECIs that were successful, uh, that you can put a lot of pressure on European level by simply mobilizing enough people to stand up and raise their voices. And that's what we're hopefully going to do the same way. Are there some other questions? Here in front, there's... You mentioned that several European Fridays for Future states approved your text and also Switzerland. When did, when did Switzerland approve your text? Um, well, we cannot state the exact date, but we had an entire legislation process that lasted when we ended the writing process. Mm -hmm. And so countries could also then propose some changes and Switzerland, I think, legislated, well, the Fridays for Future Switzerland legislated a few weeks ago. Uh, eight, years, eight days ago, there was the national meeting in Bern in Switzerland, Fridays for Future, and they, they said also, they defined climate targets, but these are not in line with your targets. And uh, the Swiss, uh, Fridays for Future people didn't uh, follow the mainstream IPCC 1.5 degree way, but uh, criticized uh, this um, procedure. And uh, for example, Switzerland, they said net zero in 2030 and not 2035. Can you comment on this? Well, um, first of all, I mean, Switzerland, as it's not in the European Union, uh, this will not be, they will not be concerned by it. But concerning the 2030 goal, well, the thing is that this European Citizens Initiative will concern the entire European Union. And that way, it is clear that it will take more time, as in the European Union, there are wealthy states and less wealthy states. So we need to take into account each country's um, specifically, and uh, this will obviously take more time as it, the entire European Union that is concerned. And so we read some reports and saw that 2035 is a possible goal for the entire European Union. Here in front, there's another question. Thanks. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one, you, you just said that Switzerland was not concerned. It's, it's a little surprising as a Swiss to hear that. Um, but what do you mean? Well, it is a European citizens initiative. This means that these objectives will uh, be put in place in the European Union. But does, does the movement have to follow, um, I mean, Europe? European Union's borders? Of course not. I mean, we all know that climate change is global. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're happy that uh, the Swiss would like come up with a net zero on 2030 or 2035. Uh, so be invited <laughs> and be our guest. Uh, but yeah, specifically the project is about the European Union. Uh, so while, while we appreciate any, any contribution by any country to save this planet, uh, the focus on this project is, of course, on the European Union. Okay. okay. Um, just my second question. Uh, you said that you wanted to keep uh, applying pressure on deciders so that something happens. 
um, is, is that going to be it? I mean, are you guys going to keep striking or is any, anything else uh, in your plans? Um, to support this um, European Citizens Initiatives, we're not only going to collect a million signatures, of course, we're also going to use the next year to lobby the Commission and the Parliament. Um, and we also want to um, create awareness in the uh, populations of EU about um, the, the European Citizens Initiative and also use the European Citizens Initiative to create this focus and this awareness about the climate crisis. Thanks. There's room for one more question. Thank you. I didn't get the point on educational material. You mean education material on climate issues? Otherwise, I can't get the logic of it. Yes, it's uh, about climate issues about the effects, about the causes and the solutions to climate change. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, you, you may hear. Yeah. Uh, like in Austria, we had the problem like back then, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, about recycling the litter and separating it because adults didn't do it. So uh, what Austria came up with is we brought it into the schools and educated the children that went home and told the parents, hey, why don't you separate glass from plastics? Yeah. And uh, I think also we don't have the time for that now. Uh, it is at least a measure to create awareness for, for all ages from young to old about the urgency of, of the situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your interest and good luck to you. So now to our summit in Lausanne, started, which started already this morning. We will have a look at our week-long program, hear some of our protagonists and our special guests. As two senior experts who are lending their support to this summit, I would firstly like to introduce Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker. He was professor of biology and co-chair of the International Resources Panel of the UN and he was pro-president of the Club of Rome during six years. Right. And secondly, Jacques Dubochet, Professor Emeritus and Nobel Laureate from Lausanne, the big supporter of Fridays for Future since its beginnings, also member of Grandparents for Future. Thank you. And then one of our participants hardly needs an introduction, Greta Thunberg from Sweden, a great inspiration for our movement. And then we have asked one of our organizers, Luki Latil, to present the idea and the program of this week. She has been working together with the under, other members of the committee for months setting up this meeting. So thanks a lot to you all. Thank you. For the last six months, the Fridays when I've been striking, I was thinking about all of these young people shouting their disagreements and their hope all around the world. And I felt the strength of humanity. Since yesterday, I've been very, very happy to see all of these young people arriving in Lausanne and exchange with them. It was really emotional to finally see the results of all of this work to prepare the meeting. We are very happy that Lausanne was chosen to host the meeting, and we would like to thank the university for having us here. 
Participants are coming from all over Europe and beyond. Slovenia, Portugal, Turkey, Russia, Estonia, and 33 more countries. This week is a wonderful opportunity to create strong connections, but also work together to define our guidelines. The guidelines will help us to coordinate better and to move forward more united than ever. So how will you proceed? So uh, we want all participants to be very active. So therefore, we will not impose any content for the discussion. We will create this week all together. This afternoon, uh, participants will choose the topics they would like to discuss throughout the week by groups. They will have the freedom to choose the way they organize themselves to explore the topics. Each group can make some inputs to the strategy working group. What is the strategy working group? So prior to the meeting, participants have already been working. They made some proposals on values and principles, strategic goals and demands. And the strategy working group will work on those proposals and will try to define more, more precise guidelines. Scientists will also be there throughout the week to answer our questions and to make sure that we are sticking to the facts. Thanks. So now we want to hear Greta Thunberg. Please stay there, everyone. <laughs> um, hi. Um, I just want to say that I am very grateful to everyone who has been organizing this and everyone who has been organizing strikes uh, everywhere and uh, just show my gratitude. And this is an amazing summit. So Oh, thank you for that. I, I don't really have anything more to say. I have spoken so much before. So. <laughs> so, um, now, Professor Dubochet, if you would like to come in the middle of the stage. There's too much emotion to speak without a note. What can I tell in this extraordinary moment? My emotion, of course. In 1968, we tried to revolutionize the world because we thought that money and selfishness were bringing our society to its death. Beside Marxist, Stalinist, Maoist, our group was untypical. Our focus was on climate. As you know, we didn't brought our project very far. A few years later, we learned from the Meadow Report, you please, uh, from the Club of Home, why the fundamental change can't wait. It must take place within our lifespan. And so we continue to be active for the planet just a bit. We also had children with my wife. I had my research career and things went on business nearly as usual. Then I got a Nobel Prize. And you know, when these strange things happen, people suddenly think that you are very smart and whatever you say must be true. So I took advantage of that and spoke as loud as I could about our stupid money-making economy, about my melting glaciers on my beloved mountains, and about the global climate crisis. I was depressed that 45 years after the Meadow Report, we didn't progress a bit A tragic. Greta, last year, in November, I heard you for the first time. It was the TED Talk in Stockholm. 
Oh, la, 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 la. <laughs> it was a shock. I cry a lot. And soon after, I could walk through Lausanne with a large number of young people of the climate strike who took me, took me with their movement. The movement you have initiated. You say, don't look for hope. Look for action. They and their friends from all around Europe have organized this working week in order to frame the continuation of the action. Here you are. Here they are. With emotion, modesty, and thankfulness, here I am. Thank you. Uh, we now hear Professor von Weizsäcker. Thanks very much, Hannah. I had the great honor being invited this morning to give a little introduction on the scientific side. In passing, I also mentioned that I am one of the early signatories of Scientists for Future. 26,000 scientists in at least the German part of Europe have signed because we are very, very happy that the young, the school children, had the courage of putting the goal of climate stability above the goal of being good uh, students at school, which evidently is correct. And uh, we scientists were so unbelievably grateful for this um, popular support by the new generation. Now, in terms of substance, what I said is essentially three things. One, some 90% of the global warming takes place in the oceans, 10% in the atmosphere. So, coastline countries, Switzerland doesn't belong to it, uh, have to be extremely worried by the potential of the seawater table rise. And it could become an abrupt kind of change if, for instance, the Greenland ice or the West Antarctic ice plate gets a rift or so and glides off into the ocean. In a matter of two weeks or so, the cities of Bangkok or Amsterdam or Venice or Hamburg or so would be flooded. You know? Unbelievable dangers are looming. Second, if we only concentrate our action on Europe, we are losing the war because more than 90% of the currently newly built and planned coal power plants are in the developing countries, of course. And unless we persuade them that it can be lucrative and good for them to stop building coal power plants and make money out of um, renewable energies and energy efficiency, which is a great potential, we are losing. It's just not good enough to make Europe look better. And the third thing is, we have to establish political frame rules that make it more profitable to do the good thing instead of doing the bad thing. Under today's conditions, building a new coal power plant is tantamount to printing money. 
You know, that's the only reason why it's done. Unless we change that by a fine on carbon dioxide emissions or so, and perhaps a premium for absorbing uh, carbon dioxide or so, for instance, by good agricultural soils, then we cannot win the game. And I'm so much by heart and emotion on the side of Fridays for Future that I find it, as a former politician, extremely important to also work on this third uh, agenda of making politics helpful and not destructive to the goals that Greta Thunberg has so wonderfully formulated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we already heard two of our participants. As I said before, we are lots of different participants from different countries coming for different reasons. So we want to hear some more quick impressions from other participants. We have uh, three participants here in our room. Um, so Christine. Christine is from Estonia. And um, she, what, what, why are you, what are you looking forward to within this week? Uh, it's a unique opportunity for us Estonians to have a say in all of this and help grow the movement. As a small country, we don't have that many strikers, so I think it's important for us to see that there are so many other people fighting for the same cause as we are. So we're definitely looking forward to the strike on Friday to keep us motivated. Okay, thank you. You can just join us on stage as one of the representatives of another participant. Um, Sophia, why are you activist in Fridays for Future? First of all, hello. You know, um, years ago, uh, when, before the movement even started, I was feeling uncomfortable what was around me. No one seemed to care about the same things that I did. So that was so frustrating. But now we are a whole community and this meeting is so important because it gives all the young boys and girls and all the participants a chance to meet, to share interests, exchange ideas and discuss about what we love. Thank you. Thank you. Forgot to say Sofia is from Italy. <laughs> and then there's Ilyas from Ukraine. Why did you come to Lausanne? The movement is struggling. Struggling in post-Soviet countries. In my country, Ukraine, as well as Russia, as Azerbaijan. In our countries, messages from Europe are not heard because they cannot be applied. So many youngsters are not motivated and are afraid to request the changes and the future that is due to them. In some places, they are not even allowed to speak. I am here because I want to show them that it is possible and that we all should raise our voices together. Thank you. So thank you very much for everybody and everything that has been said. We have now 10 minutes for questions concerning this week. And afterwards, there will be 30 minutes of free questions and answers. So please start with your questions concerning the summit now and keep all the other questions for later. We have talked about coal power plants and in the European climate, in the European Citizen Initiative, Actions for Climate was a justification that developing countries are slower in going to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And this means uh, beyond 2050, uh, today, new coal power plants are built, for example, in Vietnam, South Africa, Indonesia, and other developing countries. And they operate maybe 40 years, 2020 plus 40 is 2060. And I have the impression that the 
initiative presented here is accepting this with their word uh, climate justice. That means the developing countries can continue uh, beyond 2050 with the fossil fuels, but I think this is uh, totally not acceptable as mentioned um, by Mr. von Weizsäcker. And therefore my question to Greta Thunberg is, uh, do you think it's better to change the climate justice definition uh, to the following? Those members of governments, former and acting, responsible for climate damaging policy should be sent to prison or to jail. First, I want to say that I have nothing to do with the European Citizen Initiative. So just so I don't, because someone in this movement says something doesn't mean I stand behind it. Just so you all know. Um, I mean, was the question if those who are polluting should be jailed or the politicians? Uh, um, that is not up for me to say. Yeah, but I mean, we can't blame this on individuals. We can't blame this on politicians, on the market, on in individuals. I mean, this is a system that is wrong. I have met so many politicians who really want to do more but can't do more, so we shouldn't be so hateful to politicians, to individual politicians. Then of course they have, then of course they have a bigger responsibility than many others, uh, which they should take. Thank you. Um, are you planning on delivering um, also an, a concrete program initiative at the end of the week, or what is in plan? Um, so during the week, we will. I mean, it's the first time that we meet in person, so we are coming from very different countries. So at the end of the week, we will know how to move on. So there is already the strike uh, coming in for the 20th and 27th of September. So that's the date for sure. And then we will see how, what we want to do and how do we want to develop in the future. So that's something we will discuss. Yeah. There's a question back there. Okay, first here. We've, we've been talking hello uh, <laughs> we've been talking about uh, the, the way to get out of uh, the problem of uh, uh, climate now uh, there is something that is in most of uh, of the minds of people is about decreasing economy do you think that uh, there is a way and how we would do that Decreasing economy. Is there someone who can answer that? Yeah. What's the answer? <laughs> Decreasing economy may be necessary, but extremely unpopular. So it's not going to happen. So uh, my, my first uh, sort of activism has been to decouple economic well-being from destroying nature. And this is possible. Um, in a report to the Club of Rome called Factor 5, we are proving that a five-fold increase of resource productivity is technically available in the long term at 20-fold, meaning we can increase human economic well-being 
by something like a factor of two or so, while at the same time dramatically reduce not only carbon dioxide emissions, but also land use, uh, minerals ex uh, uh, extraction, uh, water extraction, forest destruction, and all that. So this decoupling strategy comes first. But one, uh, if population increases worldwide, furthermore, then comes a point where decoupling will not be powerful enough and then comes your question, what is left? And the answer must be, become more modest. It's extremely unpopular, but unavoidable. Are there some other questions concerning this week's summit? There's one here. Is it? Hello? Ah. Um, my question is for Greta and as well as the two guests. Uh, firstly, Greta, um, you've been uh, striking for almost a year now. I'm wondering how do you feel seeing this many people, young people, your peers gathering here this week? How do you feel about the movement almost a year into it? And uh, to the guests, after spending your careers working in science and knowing climate science, how do you feel about the environmental movement, seeing young people rise up like this? Um, as everyone has been saying, it is incredible to see these many people uh, from so many different countries and to just walk around and seeing these people is so, yeah, it feels amazing to be here. When I was young, I took to the streets against local pollution. But that, that doesn't help climate. So I'm extremely happy that the new generation takes to the streets for protecting climate. And this I say as a scientist. I was a physicist and later a biologist and know a lot about climate physics and find it absolutely necessary that our civilization learns what the present generation of school uh, girls and uh, boys is telling us. I hope that more old people like me listen. We could think about what shall we do today? Or can we do this or that? And we are going to decide that in the Conseil Communal de Morges. But that's not the way. We know, you tell us, and we know exactly where we have to go. Out of carbon as soon as possible. Now, there is a bunch of journalists here. You are not neutral person. You are people who help to inform the people. And it is not my knowledge to know how we go there. It's collective intelligence, and you are important to produce this collective intelligence. And she put a lot of strength on this movement. Now you continue. Hi, I'm Jamie, Associated Press. This is for Greta. Um, thank you for everything you just said, and you're talking about um, the need for the, for the importance of the movement and carbon. And um, Greta, this, I just, the question is really, um, there's been a year worth of protests. Where do you see things going now? Where, what kind of concrete action do you want to see? And particularly with regard to the IPCC, which is meeting in uh, Geneva this week, if you just tell us what your ambitions are. Thank you. We, we, yeah. Hmm? What, did, what did you say? I can't remember. Uh, yes, this year has, during this last year, met, lots of things have happened. Um, 
and then of course the global emissions haven't gone down so we're still back on square one um, so of course uh, we will need to do so much more we are still only scratching the surface um, what at least what i'm going to focus now on and i mean everyone in this movement is to spread awareness spread public awareness of what is going on because i believe that once people fully realize the situation we are in then they will change they will wake up because i don't think people are evil i think we are just not aware of the situation so that is what i'm going to focus on now and we um and just present the facts and tell them that this is the current best available united science so you know Right. Just about IPCC, could you say anything about the meeting this week? Yes, um, the IPCC are coming together in this week in Geneva, uh, Thursday, yeah, uh, to present a new report. So, uh, what should I say about that? What what I hope for is that the essence of what is in that report and what they are saying is going to be spreaded that journalists will actually write about it and that the media will write about it and so that people become aware of what they are actually saying. Hi, um, I just had a question with the political, as you said, politicians sometimes cannot change the problem. Uh, and we know in Switzerland it takes usually a lot of time. So how can we, how are the ways, uh, how are the other ways um, than putting poli political pressure? Is it a good way to, to put pressure on politicians or is it not going to change anything? Maybe Mr. Dubochet knows what's happening in Switzerland. Yeah. So, uh, so with some other people, we've been meeting the Minister of Environment, Simleta Samaruga, and we can really see that, yeah, the Swiss system is long. Um, the, I mean, bringing the youth into the streets um, really put pressure on, on them. And they see that we really care and we are really there to push the message forward. Um, then the way, I mean, to bring the awareness to the whole population means that then the population can also do something. And yeah. But is there other ways than just uh, putting pr uh, pressure on politicians? If it does not work, how, how are you going to change the, the system then? I think that's something we will also discuss this week together on how we can also put more pressure or differently. Um, yeah, that's a topic of discussion. Thank you. I'd like to add something. <coughs> I wanted to give a little historical example pertinent to your question. In the 1980s, there was a big debate about the ozone hole. And surprisingly, against all other tradition, it was the United States of America that began fighting the ozone hole by supporting the Montreal Protocol and many other things. Why? The reason was that DuPont, a big chemical company had invented substitutes for the fluorocarbon um, stuff that damages the ozone and made a fortune by protecting the ozone uh, layer. They even persuaded Ronald Reagan at the time uh, president of the US who 
was not an environmentalist, put it mildly, um, to push for the Montreal, Montreal Protocol. So the message is, is, in addition to what you rightly say, create alliances in the business community that would simply make money of, out of doing the right thing. And I believe our imagination has to work into the business community as well as into the policy community. So putting name only on the policy is, is wrong, as, as has been said by Greta and others. Uh, we have to become more creative in finding alliances that will win and not lose. One level. In two and a half months, we have election in Switzerland for our federal um, parliament. Um, other level, uh, it's so, so easy to eat less meat. It's so easy to replace our energy production by solar energy. That's going in a new direction. Hmm? The, the method on not the problem. Problem is moving. And election could help a lot. Um, I have a, sorry? Yeah. I have a question to the participant. I would like to know if there is a global thinking about degrowth. Because we heard like the idea of Professor von Weizsäcker, but what, what things the participants of the movement? Uh, you're asking about degrowth, am I understanding cor correctly? Yeah, uh, um, I think uh, we mostly all agree about that, that we can't uh, keep the economic growth going like it is going right now and I, th I don't think there's nothing wrong with consuming less because we don't need as much as we are consuming right now in general and it's uh, not that we're gonna become came and, and like uh, have no comfort that, at all in general but uh, we can do with less and it's more important uh, right now for climate so yeah why not Hi, Fabian uh, from Blick and Sonntags Blick in Zurich. My question is to Greta. Um, this morning, I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Uh, this morning, the junior organization of the Populistic Party in Switzerland released a press release, um, the Junge SVP, and uh, they called you, your movement, and your requirements highly dangerous. What would you like to answer? Yeah, I am very dangerous. <laughs> but I think, I mean, people say that all the time to this movement and I mean the whole climate movement because I mean, we are having an impact. That is why they feel like they must try to silence us and to create confusion. Uh, so I think that is, in some ways a good sign it proves that we are actually making a difference that people feel like feel threatened by us in a way um i mean all we are doing is communicating and acting on the science and i don't understand what is so dangerous with that thank you very much Mr. von Weizsäcker mentioned the West Antarctica ice sheet, which can cause several meter sea level rise. In 2013, this was already known, and the IPCC, when presenting the last assessment report here in Switzerland, uh, was talking about millimeter sea level rise. And IPCC ignored uh, the findings 
findings about the West Antarctica ice sheet. And therefore, I think IPCC in the past decades often published misleading information, especially in the technical summaries and in the summaries for policy makers. And in the last uh, meeting of the Fridays for Future movement in Switzerland, uh, we analyzed uh, the IPCC 1.5 degree report and our conclusion was there is no carbon budget available. And the question is uh, to Greta Thunberg, do you think there is a carbon budget or do you think the carbon budget is already low? Uh, what you say. Um, do you think there is a carbon budget available that uh, the world can continue in burning fossil energies? Or do you think there is at all a carbon budget available? Because we have to apply the precautionary principle on all the latest findings of science, and there is nothing to burn. There is no justification for further burning fossil fuels, nor for 20. Uh, 35, nor for 2030, nor for 2050. I mean, this is not what I think or we think. We There is no opinion about that. It's just that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in the latest IPCC report, it says that if we are to have a 67% chance of limiting the global temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, then we have on January 1st, 2018, 420 gigatons of CO2 to emit. And um, I don't understand your question. Uh, my opinion is there is no carbon budget. The carbon budget is negative, and we have to start uh, cooling the earth instead of uh, giving us uh, some more uh, to continue with those energies. So, you think uh, the 400 gigatons uh, carbon dioxide is still existing and we can burn it and emit it? I don't agree with you. I mean, as I said, on January 1st, 2018, they said that if we are to have a 67% chance of limiting the global temperature rise below 1.5, we had 420 gigatons. And now, of course, that number is much lower today. And you're talking about geoengineering. No, uh, global cooling could be, for example, organic farming where the carbon is um, going to the earth um, in a natural yeah. way by the plants, for and, example. Yes. And, um, but the question is, um, if we apply the, um, I, I think with 40, with 34 percent, it's the, uh, the future for you that the 1.5 degree target is failed, even if we continue with the 400 gigaton budget, and I think this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable that the young people have a chance of 34 percent that the world is exceeding the 1.5 degrees. One thing is about the IPCC. When it was founded in the late 1980s, it was the United States of America that made the ma formulated the mandate in a way that non-linear events must not be addressed, meaning West Antarctica. They are not allowed to work on non-linear phenomena. This is in their mandate. So I we not blame the individuals, but of course, like you, I and John Schenhofer and others say we have to address the tipping points, the nonlinear things. And then 
it is absolutely legitimate to believe, as you do, that there is no budget left if we take the precautionary principle serious. However, what Greta said essentially is cautious. If we have a chance of stabilizing climate, not at 1.5 degrees, but at 2 degrees, it is a lot better than let it run into 3 degrees, 4 degrees, 5 degrees. So making a political mechanism working that stops the current trend and doing what is possible with parties like the uh, Schweizer Host Party uh, and the re relevant people in, in, in the US. Uh, they are part of the electorate and they make it almost impossible to do the right thing. So there are different roles. There is your role of taking the precautionary principle really serious. And there is another role of politicians doing the best possible and silencing some of the bad, stupid liars. Uh, in the morning, I showed a picture of people, people prefer reassuring lies over an inconvenient truth. This is part of the political fact which we have to address if we pragmatically come up with something better than catastrophe. I'm not defending the two degrees uh, target, but I say if we have a budget left, then we can establish a mechanism making it profitable in developing countries to stop new coal power plants. If we have no budget left, we can't. That is the dilemma. My, my main message is that your question addresses a very inconvenient dilemma. And I side with you in taking the uh, um, precautionary principle is serious, but in the other half of my soul, I say, well, if we have a chance of doing something uh, to stop the avalanche at a later stage, it's better than just sitting back on uh, despair. Hi. Yep. Wait, it shouldn't work. Oh, I think it works now. Yeah. Okay, hi, I'm Clara. Sorry, technical problem. Okay, hi, Clara Pripp, WWF. You don't have to do anything with the microphone, just leave it as it is, it's already on. Yeah. Okay, I think it goes through. Yes, Clara Pripp, WWF Germany. I also have a question for you, Greta. Um, so we have the Paris Agreement for Climate Change, 
but do you think that we would need a similar agreement for nature? And is that something that uh, Fridays for Future will help uh, push for? Of course, that could be something. Yeah, and yes, that is, uh, if it's fine with the current best available science, then yes, that is something we would push for. And it's that part of the smart to maybe the organizer, if that's something you will include in the set, a focus on um, the list between climate and potentials. Um, as I'm not too that the, the participants will discuss, I'm really sure that they will bring the topics of biodiversity and nature of work because that's something which is really linked to the climate in general. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really something to be up at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, similar question from NHK here. Uh, a question to Greta. Uh, I understand you have been invited uh, uh, for UN Climate Summit in September and you are traveling by boat. Uh, hope you have a good trip. Uh, I'm just wondering how important this summit is for you and uh, what would you like to achieve uh, through the summit? And secondly, I understand this is a summit for use in Europe. But if you have any message to uh, use in Asia, uh, countries like Japan, China, we haven't seen so much actions going on right now. And if you have anything to say to uh, those youth in these countries, thank you. Yes, this upcoming summit in New York is very important. And uh, I mean, it comes now at such a crucial crucial time and I can't say we can't say enough how important that is and I think this is a great opportunity for world leaders to show that they have actually listened to us and to the science so because they say that they understand and they listen so now they will have to prove that and um, my two young people in Asia Japan China um, is I mean, there haven't been many strikes there, but there have been some strikes. Um, so, so just like every other country that we are now facing an ecological emergency, and we need to, to realize what is happening and what is required to stop or halt it. So, and um, to spread awareness, to save to young people that we we can't accept this anymore and we need to to hold the older generations accountable for this and I mean it is our future so essentially it's important we have people from all around the world my question is also for Greta um, I mean um, you are here as a participant and not as a guest or lecturer and you are on the stage and you are asked some very difficult and complex questions even though there's a Nobel Prize where just besides you. So how do you see your role in this movement to, to seek to be like to give guidance or be an example for people who want to change the behavior or how do you handle this role? I mean, I am not a leader or some kind of figure to follow. I'm just a participant of this movement. Uh, in since this is such a, a movement, this is not an organization. We don't have titles and structures like that. This is very spontaneous, and so that also makes it easier for everyone to actually have as much to to say and, and that everyone is equally important so i don't see my role as, as so special it's just that i am often invited to speak on behalf of this movement and that is of course in many cases 
wrong, but I can't speak for the Italian moment. I can only speak for myself. So, yeah. um, I had a similar question, actually, but to uh, follow up on that, uh, I'd just like to know what it feels like to become a, a symbol known the world over an international climate icon within a year and how, how you handle that. Um, yeah, this, this last, these last months have been very strange. I could not have, um, I mean, it's all ha happened so fast and it's, it's just, it's still so hard to take in everything that's happened. You, you need to pinch yourself sometimes. Um, but of course it's a lot of responsibility, a responsibility that I, and this movement shouldn't have. Um, we would love to go back to school and continue with our everyday lives, but as crucial as the situation is, as serious as this situation is, we feel like we must do something about this now. And um, so, yeah, it is too much responsibility for us children. We shouldn't have to do this. Uh, so we would love to see uh, adults and others to join us, to help us, to ease our burden. Um, but, but it's how I cope with it. It's, I mean, I don't like being in the center of tension. So it's, it's hard, hard sometimes to always have cameras on you. And, but... I mean, I just have to remind myself that it's for good cause. And um, if this is a way to, to get the media to write about the climate and ecological emergency, then that works for, for me, I think, yeah. But do, do you feel like you now have to do it? I mean, you're just kind of trapped in your own role? Um, I mean, no, of course not. Um, I mean, we could just, I mean, we do as we want. So, but I mean, the, we want to do this because we want to change the world as it looks now. So, um, where was I? Uh, where was I? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've put ourselves in this situation and no one is forcing us to do it, but I mean, we feel like we have to because this, we know what is at risk. We know that our, our future is at risk. So we want to do everything we can to, to stop that. Hello, I'm, I'm Francesca, an activist. I'm here, sorry. Um, an activist from uh, Italy, and I would like uh, a question to the activist on the stage. I have a question that, that I'm asking also to myself, so I hope that you have an answer, and I think it could be useful for the media to know too. Uh, where do we find the energy, the courage, and uh, uh, the power to do what we are doing? Um, it's, it's a lot of energy, and I'm so proud of our work, but sometimes it's useful to, yes, to know from other activists where it's from your energy. Thank you. I mean, I guess all of us are activists on this stage, but I guess you, um, I think it's a combination of fear and hope, because uh, you're of the future, and at the same time, there is a theor theoretical chance still to do something. So. So you just kind of have to, uh, yeah, combine and try to like find the find the hope side uh, through action. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, and if I can add, we should be on holiday, uh, but we are working because we know how bad the situation is, and the energy. When you fear about something, you can choose what you do with that fear. And you can join us and change that fear into action. 
And I think that's where you get so much energy because you can feel it in your gut. We need to do something now. And yeah, either you change that fear into something good or you're just blocked with your fear and you are just denying the situation. So it's up to us. How is your attitude? Question to Greta and also the young participants. We, uh, Greta, you read that you see a lot of data from scientists. What do you expect from physicians, medical doctors? Do you think they can be, they, they can be helpful? What do you expect? Yes, of course. We need everyone, and everyone can help in their special way. Um, we are doing what we can, and of course, people who have other positions and other who are, I mean, other people, um, they can help in different ways. I don't ex expect anything uh, special from people in a certain uh, group of working. How do you say? Yeah. Field, yes, sorry, um, in a special field, but it's, I mean, the bigger your platform and your impact, of course, the bigger your responsibility. So, I mean, it's not just because you have a certain, certain job, you should do something. I mean, it's, it's depending on your position, how much you, how much power you have to change things and how big of a platform you have. And one last question. I have a lot of questions, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I will ask you the first one because I am on Facebook and now a lot of people are very critical about your movement and how do you deal with particularly scientists who, that, who don't agree with your, your vision and, your, and the fa with the facts that you will. Uh, continue in French. How do we, how do you deal with other scientists? who also say we are scientists and we are not okay with this uh, fact that you put uh, forward. I mean, you would have to specify which they are, what exactly are they saying and then we can ask, answer scientifically. Like. Ask now a founder of Greenpeace, for example. How do we do? Can we do you deal with those colleagues, which are, are traitors to the we cause? We deal with them at the moment because yes, I haven't been talking. Jacques, peut-être. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Again, you are journalist. Yes. How do you deal? Oh, <laughs> you are journalist. How do you deal with? The fact of science brought by, by hundreds and thousands of competent people, and there are a few incompetent or claiming to be competent, and you want to get you are honest and you are competent and you judge them. <laughs> Can you pass?
pass him a microphone, please. Uh, Fridays for Future has two main accounts from which we broadcast our message. And one of them is Fridays for Future, and the other one is Fridays for Future Global. Uh, Fridays for Future has already been taken down once for three weeks, and it ha I think it has stopped us from getting our message across. And now, two weeks ago, the account Fridays for Future Global was also taken down by Instagram. My question to Greta is, do you think this is stopped us from um, your message across, and what do you expect from Instagram? Um, I'm not that's from the organizers I know. I know that Fridays for Future was uh, um, sorry, my brain is not working correctly. Uh, shut down. Yeah, the account was shut down um, because that's future was the at least from what I have heard. So I mean those who I know have the Fridays for Future account and not the Friday for Future Global account, but um I don't really have don't trust don't trust me too much because I've only heard one side of the story. So, and what do you expect from Instagram to do now? Because uh, maybe it's stopping us from getting your message across. I don't think they did because they were stopping us from getting a message across. I just think that there were a bit of confusion to which one were the official and which one maybe was mimicking or something. I don't know. So. I don't, and from what I've heard, Instagram has apologized, so I don't expect so and much from them. Do okay. you expect thank them to take you. the second thank account you. up? That's now rare. Okay. So thank you very much for your interest. <laughs> Sorry, we can't answer all questions. Thank you. Um, please feel free to attend our concluding press conference, which is this Friday at uh, 10 o'clock right here. And then, of course, there will be a big demonstration. It will start on Friday at 3 o'clock at the main station, and it will end down by the lake in Vidi. There will be a speech all through the week. So please all come and join us there as well. Thank you.